God didn't abandon me, the devil did. God didn't abuse me every day, the devil did. Because he was raising me as a soldier in his army. But one day, freedom showed up in my life and delivered me from the bondage. He found me in my addiction. He found me in my failure. He found me in my craziness. But how many know God is not intimidated by your failure? God is not intimidated by your past. God is not intimidated by your pain. And God will choose you right out of your pain and raise you to tell that Pharaoh, let my people go. Come on, somebody clap like we're going to go back to where the devil had us in bondage and we're going to tell those Pharaohs, you got to let my family go. you got to let my children go. Come on, somebody shout like we have an assignment from God. Amen. All right, so Satan knows whoever has the mind controls the life. There's a great book written years ago by Joyce Meyer called Battlefield of the Mind. A great book. It's a classic. And I recommend every believer read it. You get saved, read that book. That's one of her best writes, she's, books she's ever written. And it really is a battlefield of the mind. It really is. Because once you get born again, uh, Satan knows if, I, if, if God can't control your mind, the chances of you going back into bondage are pretty high. And if you don't go back into bondage, the chances of you being useful for God uh, are pretty uh, low if you're not going to give God your mind. Because just because your spirit saved uh, doesn't mean your mind automatically changes. The mind use, the Bible uses language like your mind is being saved. Well, I thought I was already saved. You are saved, but your mind is being saved or delivered. That's the word, delivered, set free. And so even though our spirit saved, our mind needs to be free. And we got to keep our minds clean. We got to put on the mind of Christ. We got to keep our minds full of the word of God. We got to keep the limitations off our minds. Some of these limitations have been built into our minds from the time we were born. And these things have to be broken. They're called strongholds. These things must be broken down and new strongholds must be built if we're going to step into full potential. I do believe this. God has a plan and a purpose for every person in this room. But the mind will be the catapult that God uses to take you there or it will be the very thing that holds you back and allows the enemy to keep you in living a life below potential. The worst thing, I think, in life is to live your whole life, one of the worst things, and to get to heaven and realize you never fulfilled your calling and you never fulfilled your purpose. And it's going to be a gnawing sense of dissatisfaction that comes from God because deep is calling unto deep and destiny is calling unto destiny. But as long as the mind's never renewed, you'll never step into that, the, to, to the knowing of the good, the acceptable, and the mature will of God for your life. Come on, somebody clap like we're going to give God praise for renewing our mind. All right. So... Number one, with the promises of God, old, lustful, worldly thinking is replaced. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.4 says, we are, we, are given us, or we are given unto us, the King James always kind of, dost thou, okay, I got it. I don't know how that got there. Benny, did you put that there? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we, we are given unto us exceeding great, I love this, precious promises. And by these precious promises, that by these ye or you might be partakers of the divine nature. Wow. That's heavy. You could be a partaker of the divine nature? What's a divine nature? Sometimes we read, we, we read words and we go, oh, cool. The divine nature. I just read that and it just jumped out at me. I've been studying that all week. The divine nature. That's the nature of God. How can I walk in the nature of God? Think about when I, what I'm saying, the nature of God. Paul's saying you can walk in the nature of God. Well, you're already made in the image of God. Every human is. They're made in the image of God. But here it says with the promises of God, you could step into that full, the, the full weight of that capacity. Made in the image of God. When God made man, he looked... He made man, and when he looked at man, he said, looks just like me. That's heavy. And what is the devil? He goes to work on us. You're a failure. You're this. You don't have this. You're not this. You're not going to be with this. You're not pretty enough. You're not tall enough. You're not skinny enough. Your nose is funny. You're not smart. You're not sharp. Blah, blah, blah. And he bombs on you all your life. And by the time God's like, hey, I'm going to use you. There's so much garbage up there. He can't even use us until we're willing to let the word of God transform our thinking. 
Can, can I submit something to you? I have a, I have a, a really belief in this. And I, I got to say it this right way because I, there's, no, there's nobody that has a special calling. I, we all have a special calling. But I do feel like it's like God knows God. It's, like, it's almost like the devil knows whom God is putting something on their life that's going to impact a lot of lives. And it's like, it's, like he, it's like he goes after you when you're young to cripple you. Because he, he, he even sees families, you know, like certain families have a tendency to do great things. And they, or, or there's potential in that family. And he tries to rob that potential young to cripple you, to make you insecure, to make you not trust people. See, some of you don't trust people because of a violation that happened when you were young or, se or several violations that happened in your life. And you don't trust people. And if you don't trust people, then you can never accomplish great things because a great leader has to trust people. So the enemy put that in you young so you'd never step into great leadership. And if you never step into great leadership, you'll never step into great purpose because you'll never do the will of God by yourself. I'm telling you, this stuff is, he's, the devil's a tricky devil. So we have to identify our weaknesses. We have to identify these is complex. We have to identify our trust issues, our propensity to, to get bitter at certain things. We got we to we 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 ask ourselves, where is this coming from and why? And then attack it with the word of God. Choosing to not be limited by the pain of the past or the experiences of failure from the past, but choosing to be dictated in the, in the mind by the promises of God. What are you saying? If God said that's me, then I say that's me. And if you keep saying it enough, you'll believe it. And what you believe, you'll say. And what you say, you'll believe. And you'll reinforce belief systems that'll transcend where you are right now. Partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Ephesians 2.3 said it this way. We all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Tim, Titus 3.3 says, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. <laughs> he, said, he said, who was that? He said, all of us were in somewhere, 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 somewhere you were there. And in the mess, in the lust, you could say like it's a big, say it's a big, you know, like uh, I saw this movie. I watched the Gardens of the Galaxy movie, Gardens, Gardens, Gardens of the Galaxy. My son likes the Avenger stuff. So this is one like, I don't know, it's some island, some whatever. And it's just like this murky kind of like swampy thing that one of the heroes gets put in. It's just disgusting. And it's just kind of like the world. It's just like this big pool of lust. It's just dirty. It's nasty. And when God found us, we were all swimming in there, taking a bath, listening to Bob Marley. Come on out. <laughs> Don't worry about a thing. Come on out. <laughs> all swimming in bondage. Hello. And it was normal. We looked over. Our friends were in the pool. Our family's in the pool. Mom's in the pool. Dad's in the pool. Hey, this must be normal. The pool, the filthy pool is normal. And Paul says, you all came out of it, but it's actually not normal. And when you were in it, it created a form of thinking. Can I say something? Come and say something. You cannot be a friend of the world and a friend of God at the same time. I'm going to say something, and I'm going to offend somebody, but I'm going to help you. If you listen, you're going to get delivered. If you have a friend that's not saved, and they're worldly, and, you let, and you're a friend. I'm not talking about, you know, Paul said you can't, he's not talking about not being in the world and not helping people. But a friend of a, a friend, an actual friend, and you're, and you're fellowshipping with them. It's going to corrupt you. Be not deceived. Bad morals corrupt good people. And you think you're going to hang around with them, follow them on Instagram, and listen to them, and it's not going to make you perverted? You're deceived. And the problem is when you start getting used to the perversion. But what about the world? We love the world. God died for the world. We win them to Jesus, but we don't fellowship with the world because light has no fellowship with darkness. You can't be intimate.
but they, they've been my friends all my life. I know they need to be set free, but if you let them speak into you, they're speaking from a dead spirit, from a lustful spirit. I don't care how good-hearted they are. Quiet. And then some of you think you're going to date somebody in the, in the world, like you're going to convert them. You're straight tripping. And somebody needs to love you enough to tell you you're, you're deceived, girl. Brother, you're believing a lie. You can't change nobody. Only God can change people. Somebody ought to shout like God's speaking. Second Corinthians 7, 1 says, having these promises, let us cleanse ourselves. So like, think of it like a bar of soap. How many of you have, I don't like to use conditioner because it just makes my hair feel conditiony. I'm a guy, you know, I just like to feel like clean. My wife likes conditioner, that's whatever. I'm not against conditioner. I'm so, are you against conditioner? No, I'm not against conditioner, okay. But I like to feel clean, right? And so think of the promises of God like a bar of soap. And it just, you get in the word and it washes you. One of the things the Bible says the role of a husband in a family is to wash his wife with the water of the word of God. And you got to make sure that the word of God is perpetually going in your home and into your wife. So she can stay clean and pure. But you can't give her something you don't have. That's why you have to become the priest of the house. You, can't let, you cannot let mama lead spiritually and think you're not going to get in, a, in trouble. It didn't say wife, clean your husband. I know you want to change the Bible, but it didn't say that. Come on, honey, I'm going to clean you with the word. It did not say that. It says husbands, wash your wife with the word of God. Not that many amens, huh? Look at that. <laughs> Whatever. All right. Can I keep going? I'm going to keep going. Get out of that one. Okay. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says, for the weapons of our warfare. So now we know we're in a warfare. Look at your neighbor and say, you're in a warfare. Tell your neighbor you're in a fight. You have a battlefield in your mind. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds. And we are casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we are bringing every thought, 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 every thought. Follow me. Every, 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 every thought, every thought, every thought, every thought, every thought, every thought, every one, every thought, every thought. Every thought, 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 every single thought, every single thought, everyone, everyone, every thought, every thought. Oh, that's a lot of work. There you go. Lazy people never get delivered. change me and he gives you grace he gives you strength and he gives you a bible he gives you preachers he gives you internet he gives you messages oh god change me open the bible read speak the word confess it oh yeah oh god come on every thought every thought every thought every thought every thought every thought i'm gonna write a book called every thought come on every thought every thought i think i'm gonna change the title of this message every thought say it every thought every thought High five three people, every thought, every thought, every, 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 every single. And how many know a lot of us have a lot of thoughts going on? All day. Like a computer. Every thought. Every thought. What do I do with every thought? You have to bring every thought into captivity. 
Huh? Yep. You got you to get that thought, and you got to get it, and you got to bring it into captivity. What thought? Every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You got to get it. You got to bring it into captivity. And you got to say, you do not belong here. You got to go. And you have to replace that thought with the promise of God. That's the washing of the water with the word of God. Come on. How many know we get rid of fearful thoughts, unbelieving thoughts, insecure thoughts, doubtful thoughts, fearful bondage, holding thought, every thought, every thought, every thought, every thought that doesn't say what God said about me has to go and never return. Somebody ought to shout in here. We're going to bring down strongholds. I like this quote. A stronghold is a map or a, it's a map of demonic influence. So you could tell what kind of demonic influences are in people's lives by the way they think. This is how you could tell what's in families. When you look at a family and they don't, God's word says this, but they say this, that Christian, and they say this, then that's where, the, that, that's where that demonic stronghold is. That's the idol in that family. You can't just slap a sticker called Christian, and everyone's Christian. That's fine. You're born again, but it doesn't mean you have victory. We have to change. We have to be willing to change and do the work. Otherwise, we end up coming to church, dressing in our Sunday's best. I mean, some of you are timing me right now. Like, if I go over 11, you're like, what's he doing? Like, really? And I'm talking about your life because you have a religious mindset. Not a godly mindset, religion. <laughs> Think about what I'm saying. You have to be willing to sit in the Word four or five, six hours. Some of you couldn't even fathom that. But that's what it's going to require to get you free. How bad do you want freedom? How bad do you want joy? How bad do you want victory? How bad do you want great faith? You got to put the work in. I'm not talking about works, but you got to put the work in. Anything that's going to be of value or significance, of, of significance in life, you got to be willing to work toward it. And I think sometimes we neglect our minds, the most precious thing God's given us. Thinking that all the external laboring is going to produce the results. I believe in hard work. Faith without work is dead. So it's not enough just to get the mind fixed. You've got to act out what you believe. But it all starts with the mind. Renewing that mind. Working that mind. Investing in the mind. Putting the time required in the mind. To get the mind liberated. And then to get the mind to, to a place where it's actually thinking like divine nature. God's thoughts. The mind of God. The mind of Christ. I'm walking around all day to talk about we're going to double small groups this year. That's the mind of God. But I'm thinking small though. I know I am. But I'm just saying God help me just to think double at least. Because the people that I'm leading are not even there yet. But I already see you what you want to do. You want three, four million people in a church. That's what you want. But my mind's not there. I can't, fa but help me take it higher. Help me to break limitation and fear, cultural bondage, cultural oppression. Because he had a stronghold of what? She can't have children. She can't. She can't. I'm too old. She can't. I'm too old. She's sick. I'm old. She's sick. I'm old. And sickness and my age is greater than God. And God said, listen, if I can get it in you, I can get it through you, and I can get it to you. Come on, Abraham. Look up. Look up. Look up. Look up. You're not a Chaldean anymore. You're not into witchcraft anymore. You're not into curandera no more. You're not in bondage no more. You're a covenant man. You have a covenant God. And all things are possible to him that believes God. So he looks up. He's like, Cha! come on. Can I keep going? Oh, Lord, where do I go from here? Amen? You getting, you getting any word out? You getting fed today? This is, okay. So strongholds keep the truth out and they keep the lies in. 
When the mind has already been set, set, set. So Abraham's mind was set. I can't have any kids. I can't have any kids. I can't have any kids. I'm too old. She's, her womb is sick. I'm too old. Her womb is sick. I'm too old. Her womb is sick. I can't have any kids. I can't have any kids. I can't have any kids. Mind is set. Mind is set. When the mind has already been set, repentance will require humility. Because people become very proud of the way they think, even if it's wrong. Even if it's wrong, they become proud of, because that's their belief systems. And once you challenge somebody's belief systems, now they don't even know who they are. They believed a lie about themselves for all this time, and now you remove the lie. They don't even know who they are. So you got to put the truth there. And people go through this, this stage called transformation, metamorphosis, where it's a funny season. You're not what you, what you were, but you're not what you're supposed to be, and you're in between limbo land. you got to keep going after God because you're going to get stuck in the middle and end up going back. God didn't call you to go back. God called you to go forward. There's a brighter future, but you got to press through the pain of not knowing you are, not knowing who you are for a season. And a lot of people don't like that pain of not knowing who you are. I'd rather believe a lie. At least I know. I, at least I know who I am, even if it's not the truth. It's a lie, but at least I have some type of belief system. But once you challenge belief system, and all of a sudden you realize I've been living a lie for 27 years. I've been living the lie. I know my parents taught me that, but it's a lie. You should see people 40 years old, and all of a sudden they realize they've been in a lie for 43 years. And there's a few devils in there too, and you cast them out. Man, they're like, they're, they're, they're like almost, they, there's like little children. They stopped developing five or six, seven years old. They stopped developing in these areas, and they started believing lies upon lie upon lie, and now their whole life is a lie. Like, you, until you meet a man, you'll, you'll never be happy. Lie. When you get all this money, you're going to be happy. Lie. If you ain't happy now, you ain't never going to be happy. Truth. Money don't make you happy. Truth. See the lies? All lies, 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 yeah, gonna get ya. <laughs> nothing wrong with money, nothing wrong with good relationships, but that's not what brings happiness. Paul had no wife, and Paul had no money, and he died with none of it, and he was the most blessed man on the earth at that time. Don't you come sideways with me. How many know I've learned to be happy with a little? I've been learned to be happy with a lot because I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Heavy. Somebody ought to shout in here and give God glory. <laughs> Peter said, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober as obedient children, not conforming, again, yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. But he who called you is holy, and be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy as I am holy. Now, I got this scripture for two, three days, and I couldn't find it, and I just found it this morning, so I'm going to read it. It's Ephesians 4.22. It says this. Put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you may put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Point number two. I got five minutes. Ten minutes if I choose. Can we keep going? Somebody say number two. The world lives to fulfill its lusts. We live to do God's will. See? The world lives to fulfill its lusts. We live to do God's will. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you're going to be able to prove what is the good, what is the acceptable, and what is the perfect or mature will of God. So Paul says here, when your mind becomes transformed, you begin to understand things you never understood. The first thing you begin to understand is, what is the good will of God for my life? Then you begin to realize, what is God's acceptable will? 
And then if you stick with it, you begin to move into God's mature will for your life. That's called your destiny. Most people brag about destiny. They get excited about destiny. But Paul says in order to get to destiny, you got to know what destiny is. You got to know what purpose for your life is. So you go to the renewing of the mind. You, you identify, this is, God's, this is God right here. This is God's acceptable will for me. Or the, you can even go here, this, the, you may prove what is, that, what, that, what is God's good, good will. This is the good will of God. The general scriptures, the promises of God, the, the bottom line. Like, for instance, when I first realized that God wants to prosper somebody, I couldn't believe it. I realized even that God had a plan for a people's lives. I couldn't believe it. The good will of God, peace, joy, all the, the, the basic good will of God. That's a big work. That's a big work to get there. It takes a lot of work just to get there, to, to remove the lies that the enemy... See, all the media, all society has lied on God for years. Lie, lie, lie. Big storm breaks out. Wrath of God. They just called this fire, holy fire in California. Holy fire? What, God's burning houses down now? Holy fire. See, from the, from the little, it's, it's, it's lies, lies. Then you, then you get to the word and you realize, no, no, God is good. It's the good will of God. God is a good God. God is a father. God loves me. And you stay there and then God moves you on to an acceptable will. Takes you higher. You stick with it. Next thing you know, you're moving in mature will. That's that exceedingly, abundantly above all you could ask or imagine. That's the life without limit. That's the life with full potential. That's what you were designed, built, and equipped for. That's what you can do that nobody else can do like you can do it. But that takes some work. That takes time. That takes laboring in the renewing of the mind. But I believe everybody can get there because God said you could. Somebody ought to shout like we're going to renew the mind. But some of you... This why, why do you think God went after young kids when it came to discipleship? The, every disciple was 28 and under. The average age of the disciples was from like 21 to 25. Young. Why? Because their minds weren't set. They were still pliable. God, God has a harder time working with older people because their minds set. They're arrogant about their life's belief system. You can't hardly change them outside of a miracle, a sign and a wonder, or they're going through some kind of tragedy and now they're finally open. They won't change. That's how curses stay in the families because the parents' minds are stuck on stupid. And God has to bring, that's why God uses the babes to break the curses off the family. God will raise up a teenager, a high schooler, a junior high, and go after God. And come on, somebody ought to shout in here. This is powerful. Some of you are older. And you're going to have to work twice as hard, 10 times harder than others. Because of the debauchery, because of the bondage, because of the oppression, the cultural oppression, the financial oppression, everything you've been raised in, you're going to have to work 10 times harder than everyone else. But it'll make you 10 times stronger. Because God will never waste a hurt. He'll take what the devil meant for your evil, and he'll turn around for your good. But you got to be willing to pay the price to get your mind on the Word of God, to get your mind on the altar of the Word, and say, Lord, transform my mind. The strong. Glory to somebody give God a praise. There's a heavy anointing in here. I'm serious. I feel something about to break open. Just let, open your mouth and say, Lord, change me. Lord, deliver me. Lord, set me free. I'm ready. I'm willing. Here I am. First Peter 4, 2 through 5 says, in the New Living Translation, you won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires. But you will be anxious to do the will of God. You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy. Their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness, their wild parties, and their terrible worship of idols. Of course your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do. So they slander you, they talk about you. But remember that they will have to face God. 
who stands ready to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. I put enough is enough. Enough is enough. That's what happened to me 26 years ago. High on methamphetamine, smoking speed out of a pipe in, a room, in my room, getting ready to go check into a recovery home. And out of the corner of my room, I heard the audible voice of God, clear as day. And I didn't hear it once. I heard, I don't know, I must have heard it a thousand times. And I know, God, I know if God didn't speak to me audibly, I, would have, I wouldn't have went to that home. But you know what he kept telling me over and over? High as a kite. But he kept telling me, oh, it was the drugs. Man, I got high every day for years. It wasn't the drugs. I wish that would have happened back then. I heard God, man. <laughs> no, it was God. It was God, all right. You know what he kept telling me? Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Over and over. And I just kept weeping and weeping and I'm weeping and I'm weeping. And that day, I went and checked into rehab and I've never done that speed ever, ever since then, that, that day. I got delivered that day. That was enough. But I had to go to work on my mind. Don't, listen, some of your friends, people that you love, that, that, that were with you for years, now you want to serve God and they want to mock you, make fun of you. Let, let, let them do what they got to do. The only good thing that's going to come out of that for you, the first thing is going to, you're going to, get, you're going to get over the fear of men and the need to be liked all the time. Because if you need to be liked by men all the time, sometimes you won't be liked by God all the time. Because sometimes when you obey God, nobody's going to like it. But you got to be willing to obey God in the face of everyone's op opinion. <laughs> obey God. To obey God is better to obey man. Sometimes a man will say, do this and do this and back off and don't serve God. You know what? You do your thing, let me do my thing. You, you go your way, I'm going to go my way. As for me and my house, we're going to serve God. I'm tired of bondage. I'm tired of Lodabar. I'm ready to expand my borders. I'm ready to be like the sons of Issachar. I'm ready to discern the times of God in my life. I'm ready, Lord, to expand me, enlarge me, enlarge my border, enlarge my tent. Make me bigger. Make me better. Make me stronger. Make me richer. Somebody ought to shout like God's taking you to the next level. Everybody stand up, please. That's what God did to Moses. God's will. God's will for your life. God's will for my life. God's good will. God's acceptable will. I mean, we already know that. Save souls, make disciples. Some of you haven't even went there yet. It's just right in the scripture. Go into all the world. Save souls, make disciples. You know what? Then once you have to make a disciple, you can't make a disciple unless you've been discipled. Oh, hence, we run into your bondage. You can't submit to nobody. Now we find your orphan heart. We find out what happened to you growing up. We find the bondage. And until you deal with discipleship, you'll never move into maturity. You have great thoughts of being a great preacher, a great minister, a great leader. But you'll never step into that until you've been discipled. Because all that needs to be taken out of you. Your attitude needs to be fine-tuned. Your character must be developed. Somebody needs to confront you on it. Call you on the carpet. You can't insulate from everything. At some point, somebody's going to parent you. I got three claps and an amen, but it's okay. Because I'm called of God not to make you like me. I'm called of God to get you free, baby. And not everyone's going to receive me, but somebody will receive a word and get set free from rebellion, from witchcraft, from manipulation, from control. Somebody ought to give God a shout one more time. That's what's happening to Moses. Moses is about to be called into destiny. And God's coming up to Moses. There's a burning bush. God tells Moses, Moses, take your sandals off. My sandals, yes. Why? Because the next, the next level of your life, the next purpose I have for you, you're going to come, you're gonna have to come straight with me. You're going to have to become vulnerable to God. Some of us have never really done that. Been real vulnerable with God. Real vulnerable. Do what you got to do, Lord. Whatever you got to do, 
however you got to do it. Be merciful, Lord. But do, do what you got to do. Take your sandals off. Represents his past. Represents his covering up his failure, his sin. You know, his past, he had a murder back there. He wasn't raised by his, he was raised by step parents. He had all kinds of problems. And God said, take the sandals off. I'm separating you. For the place you're standing is separated ground. It's holy ground. He tells them, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their groanings and have come down to deliver them. Now, now come, I'm going to send you to Egypt to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Imagine the stronghold in Moses' mind. God sees two million people being delivered overnight. Imagine Moses, his mind. How can that be? First of all, who am I? Who am I? Secondly, I killed a man over there. I have a past. Thirdly, I stutter. I'm not eloquent. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I don't have what it takes. And God's like, you don't think I took all that into consideration? The problem is you believed a lie. I know exactly who you are. Because before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you and I ordained you. But the devil's put a bunch of lies on you. You become like a pack mule for the devil. But right here is holy ground. I'm going to consecrate and I'm going to break all that off your life. And you're going to come out of here with the fire that's in this bush. It's going to become the fire in your mouth. And you're going to step before that emperor. And you're going to tell that emperor, bow your knee to the living God. Let my people go. Somebody ought to shout like you're going to step into purpose. Do me a favor, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, we've been in two series, liberated and temptation. You know why? You know why? Are you the right neighbor? Then I'm going to tell you why. Because God is doing something. He's about to do a new thing in our lives. And he's about to take us to another level. Because we're about to step into kingdom culture not worldly culture not limited culture not poverty culture not failure culture not fearful culture but we're about to step into the kingdom culture of can we just give god one more prayer you are i call you this i don't care if you think you're this or not i call you this god calls you this and in the name of Jesus, you're going to call yourself this. And if you call yourself this, you're going to be this. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are God's special people. And you proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. I need somebody, everybody, for a seconds lift your voice and give God praise because that's who you are somebody shout Can somebody say thank you for watching freedom don't forget to follow us on all of our social media platforms subscribe to us on YouTube and take freedom on the go by downloading our SoundCloud app today once again, thank you for tuning in.